Hello, everybody, and welcome. Sorry, Claire, I'm taking your. I'm taking again, your... again. You're always doing this. So we're still sitting at our cafe in Hove. Yeah. And we're answering some questions. Even and though this is four weeks further on. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. They're very of the moment. These questions. They are. And aren't they? Um, but you still haven't drunk your tea. No, Hi, and the... we're very well, yeah. thank you. All good. Yes, yes, great. Thank Could you. Could I have another tea, please? Another tea? Yeah, sure. Great. I'll finish with that one, yeah? Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of these guys that can't eat a croissant without putting it all over myself. I can't either, but I've been nibbling while you've been chatting. Ah, I know. And, and you haven't. Yeah. <laughs> right, Claire, this week, two subjects I'd like, to, I'd like us to cover. The first, really, is just a response to our, one of our previous podcasts on, the, on movement. Mm -hmm. Because we seem to, on responses, have a 50-50 split, or roughly 50-50 split, around why people move and why they feel they need to move, and those also agree with us that find it off-putting. So I'm going to generalise with the comments. On those that are really supportive of movement and feel that it is their own self-expression, the, some of the feedback is about the fact that they can use the movement to enhance what they are doing at that moment. So in other words, if they're emphasising something, they can do a quick movement. Or, a, or if, if they're doing something that's really dreamy, they can sort of move the flute up and then move it down. And that it enables them to sort of mix mi movement and music together. And as one person said, it's like a dancer. You know that you are mesmerised by watching a dancer. My response to that was that a dancer isn't playing a musical instrument, so you're, they're, you're primarily Thank looking you at the much. visual. So that you need to watch and be mesmerised by a dancer because all they've got is how they move. But as a musician, your primary focus is to create this sound that's going to tell a story. Well, the, what, the first thing that comes to mind, for, I'm, I'm surprised it was 50-50, but... I'm well, that's generally 50 Generally 50 yeah. but, you know, again, I'm very glad there's, there's response to it. But you said something there that somebody wants to move because it helps them show the expression in the music, but then the problem then is with them, that they, if they feel they have to move to be expressive, because the expression comes from somewhere else. It comes from inside. It doesn't come, doesn't come from external movements. It comes from inside. And so maybe they're not being as expressive as they think they are because they're moving a lot. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? It does to me, yeah. Um, so again, we're, it's, it's a difficult topic, controversial subject. Um, but if I'm watching an orchestra and the first flute is moving around, then that for me is totally off-putting. It's, I'm not thinking, oh, they're being so musical. I'm thinking, for God's sake, just stop moving because you're part of a team and the rest of the team are not, you know. I mean, there's obviously natural movements that come from physically playing the yeah. instrument, but not, not waving around. Um, and if somebody thinks that they can be expressive by moving, then I think that it's... Well, maybe you have to look at maybe what is it that's making music? I mean, it's a difficult one. Before we started this, and um, I was nibbling my croissant, you, were, you made the, the salient point that there's two types of playing. There's solo playing, playing with the piano, when it's just you and the pianist and the audience, and there's playing as part of a team, when you don't really want to be the person that's standing out because you're waving around all over the place. Mm -hmm. What's your view on going to a concert, seeing natural, or I won't say natural movement because there's a fine line of what is natural and what isn't natural, <laughs> but on a flute player that is moving, sort of waving around quite a bit, is that slightly different to you? What you mean in a solo concert? Yeah. Again, for me, I don't think it's necessary because I think it's off-putting, but I think when you're on your own, then there aren't the same restrictions as if when you're playing in a team when you're on your own, you're, you're at liberty to do really what you want, as long as it doesn't detract from the enjoyment of the audience. Because your role as a performer is to communicate the wishes of the composer, not to be on an ego trip. 
And some people move so much they're on a bit of an ego trip and they sort of fall in love with, the, with their movement as opposed to falling in love with the music. I still wouldn't like it, but it wouldn't offend me quite as much as maybe seeing an orchestral player moving around a lot. Well, as an example, Kate from Chicago in USA has come back and said, I totally agree. I find movement completely off-putting and sometimes actually want to leave in the middle of a concert if the flute player is putting me off. But she goes on to say, after a bit few more sort of comments like that, that it's got to the stage now with a lot of the orchestra she goes to see in Chicago and outside the, where there's so much movement, it's like a wave going through the orchestra. And okay. she said it, for me, it's almost toned down because she's seeing a natural movement and is not focusing on the flute player that is moving. Mm. So there's so many people moving that it's just sort of... Well, in which case, yes, that could that detracts, um, of course, from the one person. Yeah. So, so yes, I mean, if, I suppose if there's more movement within, generally within the orchestra, then you wouldn't notice so much. We were only talking about if it's yeah. just... It always seemed to be that the only person who moved was the flute player. In the woodwind section, In the woodwind section. So that was, that was what, we were that was what we were talking about generally. But I think whenever you're playing within a group and you're being a team player, if you do something that makes you stand out, then that, I don't think that, that fits within that scenario. I, I mean, I remember at college one year and um, there was a flute player who decided to uh, dye her hair green. And um, so she was taken out of the orchestra because they said, we can't put you in the orchestra with green hair because you would just stand out so much, people are just going to be noticing green hair and not listening to the music. So she dyed it blonde and, and with sugar syrup and made it all spiky. So then she played in the orchestra, so they couldn't really say anything after that, but it wasn't, wasn't as obvious as the green hair. Nowadays, of course, a lot of people have coloured hair, so we've moved on, haven't we? So, you know, sort of 30 years later, it's not as distracting as it maybe was 30 years ago. So what you're saying is you and I are both old farts. Yes. That just like to watch musicians just sort of... I think when you get, as you get older, you're more sure of what you like and what you don't like. Mm -hmm. That's all, you have stronger opinions. Yeah. And I know that I like to listen to music. I don't want to be distracted. And there are some things that are very distracting. We talked in a previous podcast about Lizzo. If she comes on in a sparkling, sequined one piece, it fits into her show. I mean, I'm, on, I'm expecting that. That fits in. But if I'm going to someone playing a program of the Six Bark Sonatas with harpsichord, and they would come on in a sparkly, sequined one piece and moved around a lot, I think I wouldn't be so happy. Hold on to that thought for a second. <laughs> Nigel Kennedy, the brilliant English violin player, ended up with a Mohican haircut for many, many, many years. Mm. Went veered over to doing Hendrix on the violin, but came back to do Vivaldi, Paganini solo concerts mm. with sort of wearing scruffy clothes and yeah. spiky hair. Yeah. Is there a disconnect for what we're expecting classical flute players to do if they're playing Bach or Mozart and where other musicians can, can do? I mean, I'm not saying Lizzo would go onto the stage to play a Mozart or Mozart concerto or play Bach and go on with the same outfit that she would wear on her show. Mm. I reckon she would go on dressed beautifully in a big ball gown. Yeah, yeah. Yes, this, there's a few things going on here now, John Paul. So back to Nigel Kennedy. He doesn't offend me in what he does because I hear the most incredible music. That is uppermost in my mind. I think sometimes, oh, what a silly bugger, what's he doing? What's he, what's he dressed like that for? What's he, what's he done to his hair? But then he starts playing and he's mesmerizing. But when you have an absolute top artist whose music transcends everything else, you probably don't care. 
right? But if there's someone who's not that good, who then is doing those same sort of things, then you do care because you're not being taken away by the music, you're being distracted by yeah. what, they're, what they're looking like. So hence, when I've always played, I've always worn red socks, so people look at the socks, not what I'm playing. <laughs> I think red socks are the least of your problems. <laughs> <laughs> You've known me too long. You've known me decades. That's the problem there, Claire. <laughs> it's a, you know, it's a, it's a topic that has... There are so many variables in yeah. this. If you've got someone of absolute... One of the greats in terms of classical music... It doesn't necessarily be classical music, but in, we're talking about classical music, musicians at the moment. Then they can get away with doing a lot of things because what you hear is absolute genius. Um, but if you're not that genius, uh, then you've got to be a little bit more careful. Perfect point to finish on that. We'll move on to another contentious issue. That question is coming from the States. Jamie, Jamie, I'm trying to read it off my iPhone here while we're sat in the cafe. Jamie Helton has written, let's talk about the angle of the flute when playing. Uh -huh. I'm in my college band and I am told I have to play it at 90 degrees. When I go to my teacher, I'm also playing it at 90 degrees. But yet when I see flute players, they're always down almost... <laughs> almost vertically downwards. What is the best way to play the flute? <laughs> Where is the 90 degrees we're talking about? It's sort of horizontal. It's horizontal. Yeah, so 90 okay. degrees from the body. So horizontal. Horizontal, OK. Well... He's, a band, he's in the band, so I suppose they have to. It's, this is a problem about, about playing in bands. Again, there's a story I re recounted on a previous podcast where I was um, coaching um, a big, a large wind band, and I was coaching the flutes, and we talked about how to sit. So you sit with your chair pointing to the right of you so that you can have a good mm -hmm. angle from your flute to your shoulder to look at the conductor, look at the music stand. Oh, hang on a sec. So you just That's always turn your chair to the... To the right, yeah. so that your, your body and your knees are facing to the right of where the music stand yeah. and the conductor is. And then they got to the main rehearsal and the conductor said, told the flutes off for sitting wrongly and made them all face their chairs to him. And so then when they put the flutes up, there was no angle between their their flute in their shoulder and they had to have their flute higher in order just to sit like that. So I put the conductor right <laughs> um, privately um, to explain why. But so that's so the, the your flute position obviously has a direct bearing on how you sound, how you breathe, how you blow. Um, and so the the, both angles are terribly important. So the first angle I'm talking about is the angle between the end of the flute and your shoulder of at least 45 degrees. Then, if you hold the flute at the same level as your mouth, it creates quite a lot of tension trying to keep the flute up there. Um, and it's much more relaxed to have it slightly slanting down. Not so far as to be touching your legs all the way down, <laughs> but a, a slight slant down, so with your head at a, at a slight angle as well, slight angle to the right. It's just a more relaxed pose. And also the, the position of the flute, the angle of the flute, is, is influenced by your embouchure. And so we want to try and make sure that the embouchure is in line with your mouthpiece. Now, not with everybody, of course. Um, you look at p pictures of Marcel Moyes with his very skewed position, his flute looks like it has an angle on his mouth. Oh. But he sounded fantastic, so you don't change it. If I look, sorry, if I look at Dennis Burikoff. Dennis Burikoff, yeah. He yeah. has, his, his is sort of... Slanted too. Yeah. And you couldn't make a better sound. So I'm not saying everyone should go out and change that angle, but to play in a, a relaxed way, the flute ideally needs to be slightly slanting down. So the end of the flute is slightly below your mouth level. Yep. So some of the great flute players that you've played with and been taught with. So if I look at Sir James Galway, he just seems to have this perfect embouchure where it sort of, it just sort of meets his lips and his bottom lip and his top lip yeah. meet in the centre of the embouchure hole and there's no wonkiness. 
No. And it's a beautiful, slightly slanting, the flute slightly slants down, and the most incredible hand positions. They look so like the hands were made for the flute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's all so relaxed, so natural. Textbook. And he was taught with by John Francis, Geoffrey Gilbert. How did, how did Geoffrey Gilbert? Was he? Did he have an embouchure like that? Oh, he, Geoffrey Gilbert was also very well organised. I mean, he, he sort of started off in the in the old English style with the tight embouchure, mm -hmm. wooden flutes with no mouthpiece, and he he left his principal flute job to go to France to study, to uh, got a silver flute, and learn how to play in the French style. So he had to learn how to relax his embouchure. So he was very um, uh, uh, keen to point out to anyone who had lessons with him about correct posture, correct embouchure, um, and position of the, of the mouthpiece um, on the mouth. Now the thing is, if you, if you don't have good, uh, a good tone, then the first thing you look at is how you're positioning yeah. the flute. But if someone comes along who sounds fantastic and they look sort of a, a bit skewed, then you basically you don't touch it because you might lose that. What was Wibbs like? I mean, I, I, I can remember what Wibbs, Wibbs was like. I never saw him close up when he was playing. I obviously saw him from a distance. But... Yeah, he was, he was a, a sort of per perfectly aligned. But his mouth shape was very different. His, his top yeah. teeth were slightly ahead of his, his bottom teeth with a slightly more, it's very difficult to describe on a podcast, yeah. slightly more pointy mouth. Yeah. But also the internal shape of his mouth helped him create this incredible sound pattern. The, the roof of his mouth was very, very high. Oh. So sort of the resonance within the mouth was very different to somebody else. You know. uh, I'm just thinking, because obviously, going back to Dennis again, because I just think Dennis is just a, a genius. But going back to Dennis, who spent his college years with Wib, and yet it doesn't look like Wib even attempted to change no, how he played. there was played. no need because the sound was, I mean, Dennis was always known for his, his sound. You know, he, he, why don't, if it's not broken, don't, don't fix it. Yeah. Mm? So it's, you only try and change someone's embouchure and the, the, the position of the, the flute on the mouth if things aren't working. So going back to the question, the flutes are at a horizontal and 90 degrees from the vertical, purely because you're in a marching band, you're doing band, you're either a high school band or I don't know, mm -hmm. university bands or whatever they are over there, where it has to be like that, because mm -hmm. if you are like that, I think yeah. because it's all so intricate. It must be what exhausting. Doing. It must be. Absolutely exhausting, but I suppose they've got the music out in front of them. No, I think from what I've seen, all the videos I see, they, they, know, they, they know it off by memory. Well, then there's no need to have the flute horizontal, then. Isn't it to do with... No, that's a fair point. It must be all to do with the visual. Mm. But, you know, let's be controversial. It's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I would challenge... <laughs> there's a challenge for you. Does anyone know any professional flute player that plays the flute at the horizontal, at the which is 90 degrees from the vertical. I don't. Do you? No. I know some, and I'm thinking about Paul Edmund Davis, good, 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 good friend of ours. Who is is really quite low when he plays it. It is sort of, gosh. Not that low. Uh, what I, I, sat, I sat next to him for many a concert in the LSO. And it's, it's 45 degrees, sort of. Never sort of. hit me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Paul doesn't wander around with his flute much, does he? It's all to now, do with it. The... There is a player to watch because he's got such calmness oh, yes. when he plays. Serenity and every. Oh. Absolutely. And, and he is a wonderful role model for how to play. That's Paul Edmund Davis, if you don't know, and you need to look at look online on Simply Flute, either simplyflute.com or simplyflute.co.uk. Try both. Try both, because he has so many resources there. Paul doesn't even know we're talking about it, but he has so many resources there and so many lessons that, you know, you Free. Can... So many free things. Yeah. Lots of exercises and sequences, and it's just wonderful. 
is it is, is a, is a great resource. Yep, and he doesn't play on the vertical. So going back again to the original question before we close, Claire. I would say too high creates too much tension, too low creates drag. But if somebody... <laughs> As in dragging if, across the ground. <laughs> yeah, if someone doesn't, it makes a gorgeous sound with a wonky embouchure. A wonky angle, don't change it. Well, that's yeah, that's another question which we, we, we won't go into because it's all to do with embouchures and what is the right embouchure. But I think you briefly covered it, is in with with Dennis Burikov that when he went to the academy, his his embouchure was so wonky, but the sound he made was so wonderful that you don't just don't change it, do you? You only attempt to change something if it's not working. Yeah. Right. Thank is that you, Claire. It? That, thank you, Claire. Time to get another coffee in. Take a break. Yep. I can brush myself down from these crumbs and, from the crossing. And we, we would love people's comments still. Yes. I mean, if you, if you want to tell us that we're wrong, please do, because we like simple simple um, comments. Well, we, well, we want to be wrong, <laughs> don't we? That's the point. Because at the, moment, at the moment, all we're talking about is our preferences. and our, our personal view. It's our personal thoughts on things. And, you know, we're very happy to hear someone tell us we're wrong and why we're wrong. Well, that's the point. Say we're wrong, but please tell us why, so why? at least we can understand. D yes, absolutely. I mean, there's, I think there's a reason for everything. And, if, um, and, you know, give us the reason. That's all. And bearing in mind I'm wrong most of the time, I look forward to being wrong on this as well. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everybody, to listening this week. Uh, thanks once again to our podcast sponsors, TJ Flutes, for their continued support. You can find them on Instagram at TJ Flutes, Facebook at TJ Trevor James Flutes and on the web at tjflutes.com. Go and show them some flute love. Next time, Claire, we're going to be answering some more questions that have come in. So, um, should we stay in the same cafe? Why not? Do you know, by the time we this goes out, we've been in the same cafe for about three months. Yeah. Might have to move on to lunch soon. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thank you, Claire. Bye. Bye-bye. Talking Flutes and Talking Flutes Extra are podcast productions by the Trevor James Flute Company. For more information, visit trevorjamesflutes.com.